Hey everybody, it's the interview queen Alicia Toot here and it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you all to my interview with Niall Marr. Hello, welcome. All right, how are you doing? I'm doing really well. How are you doing over there? How's your day been? Fine. It's like first day of sunshine and which obviously means it's freezing. I mean, <laughs> it's not it's not Canada cold, but yeah. it's just like, you know, it We're adds close. like a, a layer to my day where I'm like yeah cool okay we're dealing with this now it's fine but we just had a crazy blizzard complain. yesterday so we're still dealing with that like we couldn't even leave the house yesterday so take take the slight cold that you're getting <laughs> yeah yeah this is not like this is England this is like you know our weather is just like you live in a Tupperware box like you know so it's like gray a bit shit you know just fine but <laughs> I love to compare you know I'm English to look Gotta complain, complain about the, way, about the weather. The sport. <laughs> exactly. There you go. Well, it's a very exciting time to be a fan of your music as your new two-track release, How We Drift, is officially out now. So what kind of runs through your mind leading up to a release like this one? Do you still happen to get any nerves at all? Uh, you know what? No, because I've put out so much music over the years and um, it kind of now, it's just like, everything's kind of part of the course. I love having a year. I mean, now we're like stretching into almost two years or whatever you where you were just putting out music that people had never heard. That was new to me because I'd always been in a position where we'd, we'd be touring and I'd be playing with a band and we play the songs. There was a, a venue that I've done a lot of work with just up the street from me and we used to rehearse and record underneath the venue. So what would happen is we would be rehearsing in the day. And then that evening, we'd just go, George, just play a bunch of new songs upstairs. And we'd be like, yep. So we just take the gear upstairs. Amazing. We'd just be like, hey, can we play tonight? And then we'd play the gig. And then people would get to see us play all the new songs. And then we'd know if they worked and what didn't work and then we'd be like oh shit that was a bit slow wasn't it and then I'd go back downstairs and then we'd re-record it so like I'm used to that kind of feedback and then I've gotten better at, at releasing music with this kind of like here's what I came up with in my you know in my little space without any outside input like this is what you're getting um it was weird at first but I think I'm kind of used to it now well, it's interesting to hear that aspect of usually having a lot more input because when you listen to a track like Only Time Can Break Your Heart, taken from uh, the two track release, like it's such a fun, jangly song. And I love the solo. It has such a like dreamy element to it. So I'd love for you to kind of tell me the moment that sparked the idea for the track. Because I know for you, you did get a lot of inspiration from hanging around people, from your friends. So now that you're kind of cut off from that for a little bit, at least because of the pandemic, I mean, where were you drawing from during that time? You know what? I think with that song in particular, I I had a moment, a definite moment where during the pandemic where I was like, you know what? I don't know whether it's to do with reaching a certain age where like um, I just kind of realized why I like making songs is because I like making music that I want to hear. Mm -hmm. And for me, that song in particular, that's like music I like. You know, it's, it's a chorus that is just fun for me to sing. Like it's fun to, for me to sing. I, there, there was a song um, that I used to listen to um, when I first started making music, um, Marshall Crenshaw and did it. Fuck, I can't even remember what it's called now. I'll remember it, you know. And, um, but it was a demo that he made of uh, a song that was just like an amazing chorus. And as a little kid, I remember hearing it and you can hear it's it's on his demo where it's he's playing all the instruments and you can hear like buttons being pushed and everything. I love and that like stuff. I the first thing I learned, I still have it. Um, I, I do my like ambient gigs with it and stuff. Uh, I still have my eight track tape recorder. That's the first thing I learned to make music on. And so I, I've gone from there where I'm like, well, hang on. I like making music that sounds like what excited me when I first was kind of getting switched on to music and it doesn't make a difference now if I'm playing it to people or not so I was just making a di I was just making the decision to go 
what do I like? What do I like? I like songs with choruses. I like that chord change in particular. Always liked it. And so I'm not trying to be anyone else other than kind of what it is. I would like to think people enjoy about my music. And it took a while for me to accept what it is I do. Because I think as an artist, you're always trying to compare yourself to other artists. That's, that's the thing. And you always wish you could do a thing as well as the people you think are great, you know. Um, and that's even the, some of your friends that make music, you know, as well. Like some of my friends' bands, I'd always be like, I'd see them and just be like, damn, <laughs> why don't I do that? And then it's like, well, that's because they do that. And then you try and do a bad impression of them and it kind of works. But I, I've reached a point now where I was like, if you like my music, I've put out enough music, I think, for people to have worked out what it is I do and for oh, me yeah. to work out what it is I do. So I think with this release, with the fact that I wasn't able to play live and I had to go inside and write songs that meant something to me that was only supposed to entertain me, the, the music has come out in a way that I think is very like, okay this is what I do I've been doing it a long time I've worked it out like here, here's the music here you go and take it early, I'm glad right? you like the guitar solo yeah because yeah, the guitar solo was a real it was one of my favorites I was like right we're doing it you know oh no that's so much fun I feel like something that is very signature to your music that goes hand in hand with some of those elements that you had previously mentioned is just the beautiful lyricism and the poetic lyrics so have you always kind of had that natural knack for almost writing poetry and then transferring it into song uh, you know what no I and I think it's something I'm very very like very insecure about in my music because there's and I, I don't mind admitting this that I know I think I know what I'm doing with chords and melody and I love melodies. I, I, it's, it's why I do anything. Mm -hmm. And I, for me, when I write songs, I write the melody and the chords at the same time. They just kind of like happen together. Cause I think that's how my brain thinks. And then, um, and then I write the words to fit that melody. And I think when I was, first learning to write songs and some of my real early work I'll listen back and even some of the songs we still play and they're very very simple because I am only focused on the melody and I, and I love the melody but, but this was a conscious decision this kind of like pandemic period was a conscious decision to go I need to I need to focus on actually writing words like I it was always an afterthought for me where I was just like just get them out and people will enjoy it <laughs> um and then I read uh Jeff Tweedy's book on songwriting and I knew Jeff from being a from being a little kid and it was great hearing someone who obviously writes great words you know famously writes great words but it was yeah. fantastic reading a book um where someone is explaining songwriting the way a songwriter does and I was even calling up my, both me and my dad read it and we were both like oh yeah this is cool isn't it we do this and it's fun seeing this written down this and there was loads of stuff that I didn't do and that I'm kind of like oh I'm, I'm not sure that's me but reading it and then going into writing a load of songs helped me focus a bit more on words and I think it comes from this feeling feeling a bit more um okay with yourself where I'm just like these sure. are the kind of songs I like and I don't need if you want if you want words that are like super political or you know you want a dude who's like shouty or any anything like that there are so many other people that can do that and and I have these moments where I'm like why do I do why do I do this and I'm like because well, I listen to if I listen to music like that surely someone else will listen to, <laughs> to music like that it can't just be me so I think it's now I'm okay with it and I'm trying a little harder I think that's genuinely I'm, I'm trying harder. It's interesting too because it's kind of whatever feels natural at the time right so if you're going in there and you're trying to write like these crazy political songs or ones that are crazy wordy it just it won't feel natural and something when listening to your tracks like they feel very genuine so I feel like it would almost take away from that aspect. I, I think it would be again you want from my I, I, I like to think if people listen to my music and have done for a while you want a certain you want certain box to be checked 
And that's not to say I don't sound different from record to record, but I, I, I think it would be disingenuous if I didn't tick those boxes in a way that I felt was, was right, you know? And right. for me, that's gotta be, they have to be pretty melodies. They have to be <laughs> that kind of jangly guitar around yeah. decent guitar chords. I'm like, that's, that's I've done it now for, hey. I've been doing that since I was like 14. And, and it's so been working. Like, if you can't, if you can't, well, I mean, I've still been doing it, but if you can't admit that you're, that's what you do by this point, I think you've, you need to kind of make better friends with yourself. I mean, we've of course been talking about your your newer music, but you actually began, like you mentioned, writing songs when you were a very young teenager. So do you happen to remember the very, very first song that you ever wrote? Yes, I do. Um, and it is obviously super embarrassing. And I'm like, this would be terrible if and weirdly, because I started on MySpace, there are actually a few people that still follow me. And follow what I do from when I was on MySpace, which That's is really amazing. cool. Um, and then I do get asked. There's a Canadian. There's someone in Canada who I can't remember where in Canada, but they're always like, "When you play a gig in Canada, I'm going to ask for this first song because it did go out on MySpace." And I'm like, "Please don't. I don't know. How, I won't won't know how to play it." And but the other day I was playing around. I was playing guitar and I was kind of half writing a song, and I was singing a melody and I was like. This is familiar. Why, why does this? Yeah, I was like this. There's there was an aspect of it that I thought this was this I've done this before, and I, and it took me about an hour to realize it's the very first one I did. So I was like, wow. oh God, I can't I can't do that. Oh but my God. There's um there's a song we we used to play. I'm glad we don't play it now. Um, it was off the first album I did with that band Man Made. Um, there was my first release. And we toured that a lot. And that turned into what I do now anyway. But we played that. There's a song on there that I wrote when I was about 15. And that was our first like hit, like in England. Like, you know, it got on radio stations. We were in some TV shows and stuff. And people loved it. And I was like, that was weird. Even being a person in their like early 20s still playing a song they wrote when they were 15. So I, I can't imagine how some artists who were really prolific when they were like teenagers are still playing those about tracks. playing yeah because mm. i think you have to and the pandemic made this quite clear to me i think as well what it is i do my job is to entertain people at a gig my it's not an indulgent here's my art that's what records are for at a gig i think you're there to play the songs people want to hear because when I go to gigs, I want to hear them play the songs that I want to hear. You 100%. Know? You, want to hear the, you want to hear the good songs. You want to just give the people what they want. You're lucky enough to be there. Act like you enjoy it. Give the people what they want. So if people were still wanting it, I'd still play it. But thankfully, I don't have to play the song. Thankfully, the songs I wrote when I was a teen weren't that great. I'm so glad you brought that up because I remember I was once seeing um, I went through a crazy emo phase growing up I mean you never go out of it but I saw this band perform and they barely played any of the hits and then when I interviewed them afterwards I wasn't being cutthroat or anything but I remember asking you know like out of curiosity where were these songs and they said oh no one wants to hear the hits they want to hear all the new stuff and I just thought to myself like okay you might think that but I don't know where that's coming yeah. from <laughs> so I, I, I as someone who performs it can be really uninspiring to play certain songs and that you can convince yourself they're terrible and no one wants to hear them. There is a song that I still play at our shows and we won't, we won't drop it until people really get sick of it. But, and it's from the man-made record and it's one of the few from there that we play and people, every time we start it, people love it. And I'm like, my friends, it to mean so much to me that I'll sometimes get texts from my friends who, uh, you know, I've not seen for years or anything. And they're like, they'll sort of be like, you know what? Carset Cars is still an absolute banger. And I'm like, that means, it, it means so much that you wrote something that people are still like, you know what? It's, it's near, you know, it's nearly 10 years old or what have you. And you're like, it's it's still great. Yeah. <laughs> Just but speaking. I think with you, you need to, 
as a band, you uh, as a fan of a band, it goes both ways. It's like yeah. you can't just we can't just take in the new stuff, you know. There has to be some yin yang there. There really does. <laughs> And then just speaking to growing up, you basically lived on tour with bands like Modest Mouse, The Cribs. I absolutely love The Cribs. Like I grew up listening to them. So was it initially the songwriting or the tour life that really made you realize that you wanted to get into music as well? You know, it's, it's a funny one because I obviously even being much, much younger, like so every house I've ever been, lived in with my parents, has also been a functioning recording studio. So when I was a real little kid, the, the first house I grew up in, uh, there was all the tape machines. So the studio ran through my bedroom. So there'd be little little toddler and then all the tape machines. And so I, I've always been around musicians and, and music. And then when I started to write songs, like my parents never pushed me to it. Mm -hmm. But because it's around, you just and because it's around and it's seen as valid, and I don't mean it as a valid way of making money or like you know anything like that. It, or like just something that's job. actually bringing people in your life happiness at the same time, right? Exactly. It, yeah. It's a valid pursuit for a child, which that's the thing that I think has been a massive privilege and advantage in my growing up that I never had to argue that playing guitar and not doing a thing I should be doing was a is a valued use of time you know mm -hmm. and so I when I was a little kid and I, when I was writing when I first started writing songs I kind of realized my parents would not ask me to do my like homework or school work if I was like writing a song so I used to do it to avoid doing the stuff that I hated because I was like well I won't they won't bug me <laughs> um, because I'm like yeah, and, and it was genuine, and it, it's genuine as well. And obviously I was love I enjoyed doing it, but, you know, and then, then as I got older, and particularly when my dad joined Modest Mouse and we kind of moved to the States, it was very much the conversation, you know, because at that point I'm like 14, 15, you know, onwards. And so at that point, the conversations between my parents and me were, if you hand in the work, and you 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 get good grades we we do not care what you do you know it was like you can be on tour you cannot turn up to school because the whole thing for them was the school can't say shit if you're if you do the work and you're good you know so for me it was the trade off of like i'll get school out of the way i'll just hand in what needs to be handed in and i'll it's do the it exact fine. same exact same for me <laughs> Exactly. And, and you go, you, you recognize that's a trade off. And then it was just on tour. And, I, and it was amazing. Modest Mouse for me was because it's at that point in your life where you are into what you're into. It's that 14, 15, like thing when your brain's just a sponge and you're enough of a like person <laughs> to, to, to kind of focus on what you yeah. want to do. And then I had like, a bunch of like older dudes who were in the band who were in the support bands because like I got to see like Band of Horses start it was brilliant That's and so then like cool. tour with Bright Eyes and all these bands that were dudes who like I'm not gonna he's not gonna give a shit if I say this but um Con Connor got me stoned for the first time when I was like 14. <laughs> <A> burst. <laughs> yeah, I know. And it was, it was hilarious. And I think it was partly my dad had been like trying to get his friends to be like, someone needs to introduce this to Niall. Like someone needs to do this. And I think he was just like, I got this. And it was fucking great. But like, I, I was around all these older guys that I was able to like look up to. Um, you know, that we're all, it, it was just an amazing kind of thing. And so, and I got to see so much of the world and particularly so much of America at like so 14 cool. and 15. It was great. That's you know. incredible. Yeah. Again, and then the cribs and the cribs. I was the, I was a tech for the cribs for, for so much because they only ever had one crew. And I was like, I wanted to be on tour. So that was the thing I knew. I just wanted to be on tour. I didn't want to go to school. I wanted to be on tour. So I learned to be a tech 
because I used to love hanging out with all the the like techs anyway for Modest Mouse and all you know all those guys. So I kind of escaped that way. And do you remember that band Warpaint? Yes, of course. Yeah, so I was there like only crew for a long, long time because really? I was just a fan. Yeah, and I turned up when they played in the UK. They did their first UK tour, and I was like, "Well, they're from Eugene, you know." I was like, "We we're, we're gonna get on," and I know how to sneak into venues. I know how to walk into a venue with like absolute <laughs> confidence, unshaking, com- undeserved confidence. And um, so I just walked in, and then I was like, "Oh, hey, I bet we have similar friends." And then because they're from Eugene, I assumed they all needed loads of weed. So I was like, let me just turn up with a bag of weed and then you'll be fine. And then by like, I hung out with them and they're like, oh, will we see you tomorrow? And I was like, yeah. And then by like day three, I was getting calls from the record label being like, are you the one that's going to take the merch deal, the merch delivery then? And we need this. And then I worked with them for like two years. Wow. That's incredible. I'm so glad that you brought up that whole confidence and walking in thing, because when I started interviewing bands, I was 16 or 17. And I got to the point where I was trying to balance school and then that like nightlife of interviewing and still going to the concerts because bands that I loved. And then I got to the point where I wouldn't even be on a guest list. I mean, the people who run the venue just know you and you just walk in. You're like, all right. Yeah, you're not even on the list. Like it was, it was the best growing up. <laughs> exactly. And you know what? You know, what really helps me and you really good looking. Hey, see, helps. that definitely helps out, helps. right? <laughs> we just walk in, flash the money maker, Bam. walk in anywhere. I oh, know. <laughs> well, the last thing I wanted to ask you about today now is, of course, we're talking about other people's music. And when it comes to others' tunes, like you have a great taste in music. So which one of these three bands would you have loved to hang out with? You can choose between the B-52s, Broken Social Scene, or Built to Spill. Right. Broken social scene, I am lucky enough that they are all absolute near and dear friends. They're Amazing. another band that got to see me grow up. It's one of my reasons I love having, I love getting to hang out in Toronto because usually I get to hang out with the sweet. I know it's a trope that Canadians are really nice and what have you. Those, <laughs> we are. <laughs> yeah. Those people, aside from Canadians just being just sweet, those people are the sweetest human beings in the planet. And they really, they have been so, so nice to me. And I got to play, uh, I got to play anthems for a 17 year old girl on stage with them. Uh, they, they, tur- they basically was like, I- I'd seen him play uh, in Manchester and I was, I was picking up some gear in London and I was like, well, I'll come and stop by at the London show. And I stopped by and I, they were like, and Kevin was like, hey, you really like anthems, don't you? And I was like, yeah, obviously, who doesn't? And then he was like, do you know how, do you want to play it tonight? And I was like, okay, do you know how to play it? And obviously I did the like, no, no, I don't know how to play it. And in my head, I'm like, of course I know of course how you to do. play it. <laughs> so they were like, oh, let, show, show now how to play it. And, you know, they're like, okay, it's like this and this. And I'm like, oh, yeah, let me just see if I've got it. And I'm like, you know. Show off. Like, wow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not like I've not been playing it, like, for years. But yeah. so, and, and I had that moment on stage with them where I, I, I was like, and someone videoed it. And it's on YouTube somewhere, buried. And it's good quality as well. And I am, like, maybe 17, 18. And you're just riding and I, high. <laughs> and I'm like, this is the greatest moment. Of, you get to play your favorite song with your favorite band like it's fucking great so and then built to spill i know uh, doug from portland and once i'll be quick but once they were opening for dinosaur junior in the uk on a tour oh what a and good I went, double bill i know check this out i like finished work i was working in the city and i got let out of work late like got the train over uh, to leeds the venue wouldn't let me in because I like, and I was like, oh shit, okay. And I managed to find my way, sneak round through into the venue. I caught the last 25 minutes of Built to Spill's like opening set. They were so good. And this is so stupid, but I know you'll get this. They were so good. I had to leave. I couldn't watch Dinosaur Junior. Damn, were, yeah, I've been there. 
<laughs> yeah, I was like, I, I was like, wow, okay, I've got, I've got to take myself home. So I, and I just got on the train. I, I got on the train. I didn't even put music on. I like got on the train and was just like sat there, like. Whew. I've literally been there. Okay. Like that exact wow, same emotion amazing. running through yeah. you. You recap everything. You think like, oh my gosh, I'm so happy I got to witness that myself. Like it just, there's something about live music that just hits so differently. And I'm, I can have no new music for a while. I'm like, no, 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 no. That's got to stay in there. You're like trying to stop it escaping. Just captured in the um, mind forever. So, <laughs> I think beca because I've hung out with those guys, I'm going to go B-52s because I feel like they are a really good party. And oh, yeah. when, when I lived in Portland, I was um, one of my neighbours was uh, Peter Buck from REM. He lived oh, up my the gosh. street. Yeah. I know. And he's an absolute sweetheart. Like, he's, he's so much fun. And he knows I'm a B-52s fan. And because they, they came up together, R.E.M. and the B-52s, because they were all from Athens. Of course. Um, and so he used to just, like, every time he knew I wanted to hear a B-52s story, so he'd just tell me all that kind of stuff. What so a those guys knowledge. Sound, I know, I know. That's what I mean. I've had a pretty good, like, I've had it, you know. Yeah, I've it's got not bad. <laughs> yeah, I know. Oh, that's incredible. Well, no, Niall, I really... I'm going B 52s. Okay, no, good. That would have been mine as well. Like, it's three incredible bands, but I just, there's something about the groove that every B 52 song brings. It's like, it really is a party. So, um, yeah, I just appreciate yeah, yeah, yeah. you coming on here to share all of those stories, you know, from the new tunes to growing up. It's been absolutely wonderful having you on the show. So, thank you so, so much. Oh, thanks. And, you know, absolutely appreciate it. I love, love, you know, good questions. Like, good thank questions. You. They're fun. Yeah. I appreciate that. Well, to everyone watching, this has been the fantastic Niall Marr. Be sure to check out aliciatoot.com for plenty more exclusive interviews and features. And we'll see you all next time, everyone. Bye.